Naples is a city of great antiquity, with a historical trajectory that's seen it exposed to a very wide range of cultural influences, all of which have left their traces in the city's urban fabric and its architecture. Its street pattern and wealth of historic buildings from many periods have had a profound influence on many parts of Europe and beyond. In Naples, all the pride and resentment of the Italian South and all the historical differences between the two wildly disparate halves of Italy are brought sharply into focus. This is the true heart of the Mezzogiorno, a lawless, petulant city that has its own way of doing things. Naples is a surprisingly large city and a sprawling one, with a centre that has many different focuses. Between the Sorrentine Peninsula and the Campi Flagrei, Naples gazes out onto the open gulf of the Tyrrhenian Sea, within a spectacular setting, dominated by Vesuvius, the sea and the hillside, with one of the most beautiful and captivating townscapes in the whole of Europe. A wonderful climate, a spectacular sea and magnificent cities constructed centuries ago by the ancient civilizations who passed through the Gulf, leaving behind them the traces of their art and architecture. The Bay of Naples, rich in archaeological, artistic and monumental works, is renowned for the warmth of its inhabitants. The Bay represents a natural setting of inestimable value with exceptional wealth of natural beauty stunning scenery and the extraordinary enchantment of its islands and landscape, which made it the favourite destination of artists and personalities, from the Emperor Augustus and Tiberius. Taking a boat charter to the Naples Islands, visitors can reach the beautiful little islands which lie just in front of the city. A Naples Islands tour is the ideal way to admire the islands with their natural beauty and its reminders of the Roman age, characterized by a colorful Mediterranean architecture. Vibrant, passionate, unique. Words which perfectly describe the bay lying in the shadow of Vesuvius. A land which is home to ancient traditions and archaeological and artistic treasures. Castel del Ovo, or Egg Castle, rises upon the islet of Megaride in front of the small promontory of Monte Eccia, which divides the two small bays on the waterfront of Naples the Harbour Bay and the Riviera di Chaia. Framed by the Borgo Marinaro and the Porticciolo di Santa Lucia, it's one of the city's most famous symbols. The Castle Drove is one of the most substantial survivals from the Norman periods, built as a fortress monastery on the site of the villa of Lucullus. It was remodelled on several occasions and given its present form at the end of the 17th century. In this magical place, full of stories and legends, it's said that the destiny of the city lies. According to one of the most fanciful Neapolitan legends, the name of this castle derives from the egg that the Latin poet Virgil apparently hid in a cage placed in the dungeons of the castle. The egg was locked up and kept hidden because the fortune of the sea castle 
depended on that egg. Since then, the destiny of the castle has been in parallel with the fate of the egg. Less mythologically, this is where the Greeks from Cuma to the north first settled the Bay of Naples in the 5th century BC. Centuries later, the island became the home of the last Roman emperor, exiled here after the empire was overrun by the Goths. Local residents destroyed all of the Roman structures that at one time dominated the island in the 9th century to keep them from being used by Arab invaders. The Normans erected the first permutation of a castle in the 12th century. The prominence of Castel del Ovo faded to a degree when the royal residency of Charles I of Anjou constructed a new castle, Castel Nuovo, and moved his court there. It served as a defence castle throughout the Middle Ages and was significantly increased in size in both the 16th and 18th centuries. Impressively, the formidable Egg Castle remained a place of royal residency until the 20th century. If stones could talk, those used to construct Naples castles would speak volumes. Every ancient building has a fascinating story to tell, even more so when they're castles, historic residences of royals and emperors, and more often than not, key players in war and conspiracy. On the ramparts are some cannons, positioned in such a way that they would fire at the city and not out to sea, as one might expect in a fortress meant to protect against attack by naval forces. It turns out that the ones visitors see today were put there for ornamentation, having been recovered from the bottom of the Bay of Naples when a ship went to a watery grave centuries ago. Yet tales of guns from the castle taking pot shots at the city aren't entirely false. Around the year 1500, when the French and Spanish were belligerently disputing the future of Naples, the Spanish parked their artillery on the height of Mount Ecchia, the cliff directly across from the small island of Megaride, where the Egg Castle is situated, and shelled the Angevin French in the castle, who of course returned fire. Perhaps the most alluring part of any visit to the medieval castle is viewing the city and harbour. The castle dominates the harbour and backdrop of the Tyrrhenian Sea. Castel del Ovo has always marked the political and historical changes in the city of Naples. In 1733, it was besieged and bombed by the Bourbons. Since the unification of Italy, the castle has been utilised as a military centre. Porta Capuana is one of the city's main gates and one of the main Renaissance monuments in Naples. It dates back to the late 15th century on the design of Giuliano de Maiano. The impressive triumphal arch emerges from two mighty cylindrical towers, usually referred to as honour and virtue. It seems a smaller version of Castel Nuovo's triumphal arch, crowned in by the same squat round towers. Due to the enlargement of the city walls, the former gate, nearer to Castel Capuano, was transferred into the modern position. The arch is clad in marble. The original relief, portraying the crowning of Ferdinando I, was replaced in 1535, on the entering of the Spanish troops of Emperor Charles V. Passing through the gate, 
you reach the main street that traverses the old historic centre of the city of Naples, the Spaccanapoli. Spaccanapoli is a long straight road and on both sides a tightly packed labyrinth of narrow charming alleys spreads out. Walking along the Spaccanapoli, it's possible to follow an itinerary in one of the most characteristic areas of Naples, with churches, squares and old tiny craftsman shops and laboratories and historical buildings. Built in the second part of the 12th century, following Guglielmo I's will, Castella Capuano, which rises in the proximity of the ancient Porta Capuano, was the residence of the Emperor Federico II of Svevia. And after the construction of the more comfortable palace of Castelnuovo, was the residence of many kings, princes and dignitaries of the Angevin and Aragonese dynasty. In Spaccanapoli Street, the simply vast Duomo di San Gennaro is the city's cathedral and is without doubt one of the most stunning buildings in the whole of Naples. Dedicated to Our Lady of the Assumption, but more commonly to San Gennaro, the cathedral was built by Charles II of Anjou towards the end of the 13th century, on the ground where the Church of San Stefania used to stand near the Basilica di Santa Restituta. It preserves three portals of the original construction. On the middle one, rich in sculptures, a Madonna col Bambino by Tino da Camaiano and the column-bearing lions of Nicola Pisano School. The facade was restored with its current pseudo-Gothic shapes by E. Alvino and later modified by Pisanti. An interesting fact about the Cathedral of Naples is that twice a year, a vial of blood that's said to be from the patron saint himself is brought out for public viewing. It liquefies, and legend says that if it were ever not to liquefy, something unsavory would happen to Naples. This is just a part of the folklore that's connected with the Naples Duomo. Girolamini Church, with its massive white marble façade, is situated one block from Via Duomo and the Cathedral of Naples. It's one of the most spectacular churches in Naples. In a city full of medieval and baroque churches and monasteries, the premises that contain the Church of Girolamini constitute one of the most supremely important religious areas in the history of the city. There's no better way to experience Naples than to wander down the Spaconapoli. It runs right through the heart of the city, showing you the many facets of the place. History marks every step of the way as you wander down this long, narrow road. Spaconapoli is a combination of two Italian words, spaccare, which means to split, and Napoli or Naples. That's precisely what Spaconapoli does. It separates Naples into two, as it runs from east to west, beginning from about halfway up the side of the Vomera Hill at a point directly below the San Elmo Castle and the San Martino Monastery. The splendid Gothic church of San Lorenzo Maggiore stands on layers of antiquities. It's located at the precise geographic center of the historic center of the ancient Greco-Roman city. Ferdinando San Felice's facade preserves the original 14th century marble portal. Near San Lorenzo Maggiore, on top of a large stairway with two ramps, is the Basilica of San Paolo Maggiore. Built in the 8th century on the ruins of the temple dedicated to the Dioscores, Castor and Pollux, it's situated in the heart of central Naples, in the fora of the ancient Neapolis. On each façade, it has two niches with the statues of the saints Pietro and Paolo and two Corinthian columns of the former temple of the Dioscores with traces of architraves. The statue of San Lorenzo stands near the façade of the church.
The famous street, San Gregorio Armeno, takes its name from the homonymous monasterial complex. Here is the centre of production and sale of nativity scene figures. The little street is full on both sides of shops and workshops that invade the road with stalls and various exhibitions. San Gregorio Armeno, with its shops and stalls, is the heart of the Neapolitan Christmas, the obligatory destination of a sentimental walk in search of a new piece to put in the nativity scene. The street is where Naples happens. Life is lived here in all its chaotic glory. It's bustling, it's unique, where Neapolitan is a language in its own right, and visitors will hear the harsh dialect bellowed at high volume. It's full of historical, artistic and cultural traditions. Today, Naples is a bustling city, located in a beautiful natural setting, with a colourful street life, chaotic traffic and numerous narrow and winding alleyways that lead to many quaint shops and restaurants. Here, high-energy street drama is played out in public among the squares, palaces, churches and galleries and street vendors. One of the most beautiful works by the Aragonese in Naples is Piazza San Domenica Maggiore, which was opened by Alfonso I and is dominated by the homonymous church and by the Guglia or spire. The spire of San Domenico is located in the square. The name refers to San Domenico di Guzman, founder of the Dominican Order. The spire was started after the plague of 1656 and was designed by Cosimo Fanzago. Naples is one of those great cities that has art and culture pulsing through its veins so vibrantly and intensely that despite the many great art galleries and museums inside it, the best cultural activity is simply to sit back and observe the city in its splendour. Naples has the best pizza, the best coffee and arguably some of the most enchanting and entertaining people in Italy. The streets of Naples are fascinating not only for the people, but also for the random shops. In Benedetto Croce Street, in the Spacanapoli district, is the Carafa della Spino Palace, which dates back to the end of the 17th century. The high portal is dominated by two satyr statues between the balcony and the open tympanum. The spires of Naples are three monument columns in the historic centre of the city. The term play column is commonly used for such structures, since in many places in Europe, such columns were built to celebrate the end of or deliverance from the plague. They were common in the Catholic countries of Europe, especially in the 17th and 18th centuries, when their ornateness became one of the most visible features of Baroque architecture. Naples churches are ancient and charming, and many of them are enveloped in a mysterious air. Churches with a great historical and cultural importance, Gothic or Baroque, more or less majestic, with serious or joyful facades, the visitor can find them everywhere. The Gesù Nuovo church was built by the Jesuits and still preserves the facade made of trachytic rock with dog tooth molding. Dedicated to the Bourbon King Charles VII, Dante Square 
was known as Foro Carolino until Italian unification in 1860. Piazza Dante, for centuries an important centre of the city, is a neuralgic point for all movement in the city and for the activities of its citizens. This square, named after one of the greatest names in world literature, is dominated by a 19th century statue of the poet, sculpted by Tito Angelini. The sandblasted marble Dante looks out over anarchic Via Toledo in arm-raised disbelief. Long ago, the square was called Largo del Mercatello, simply Market Square, and then, in 1765, was rechristened Foro Carolina, after the wife of the King of Naples. The hemicycle of the Forum is adorned by 26 allegorical statues situated up high and representing the virtues of the King. Allegory encompasses such forms as the fable and parable. Characters often personify abstract concepts or types, and the action of the narrative usually stands for something not explicitly stated. There are many squares in Naples, and each one tells a personal story. Naples is a mixture of heart-stopping beauty, life-threatening chaos, and a strong sense of life being lived to its limits, right in the face of the visitor. Certosa di San Martino is one of the most well-known and visible structures in the city. The magnificent charter house, built in 1325 by Charles II of Naples, on the hill overlooking Naples, has gone through a series of complex architectonic and decorative changes. The original Gothic structure has been modified through various Renaissance, Baroque and Rococo works. For centuries, it served as a Carthusian monastery, inaugurated in 1368 and dedicated to St. Martin of Tours. Built at the foot of the castle of San Telmo, it contains an 18th century church with its various sacristies, which are full of works of art, so that it's almost a gallery of Neapolitan art of its time. The National Museum of San Martino is Naples' most varied and surprising museum. The great heritage collected shows the various aspects of Naples' history and culture with its rich artistic beauty, curiosity and various elements of style. Perched high atop Vomero Hill, and commanding a formidable position above the Gulf of Naples, the San Martino Monastery and Museum has come to be a symbol of the capital of Campania. Known as the Maschio Angioino, the Angevin Fort, Castelnuovo was built for Charles of Anjou towards the end of the 13th century on the instructions of the Anjou family. It became an important cultural centre where artists and writers such as Giotto, Petrarca and Boccaccio stayed. The fact that this phenomenal construction remains in such good condition is testament to just how solid the history of Naples is. The Maschio Angioino was significantly embellished and enlarged in the 15th century by Alfonso I Aragona, the first ruler of the Aragonese dynasty, 
Around this time, the spectacular triumphal arch of Alfonso I of Aragon was erected in between two of the castle's towers. The arch forms a clear chromatic contrast between its own whiteness and the dark upper perno, a particular kind of trachyte often used in Naples for building. Above the attic is a second arch, which opens between coupled ionic columns. These support a second attic, decorated with niches, containing the Statue of Temperance, Strength, Justice and Magnanimity. Dominating this remarkable achievement is a semicircular tympanum, bearing the allegorical representation of two rivers, and above this stands the Statue of Archangel Michael. It can easily be defined as one of the most outstanding works of Renaissance honorary architecture, since it represents an inseparable union between the art of the most important sculptors of the time and the traditional canons of the Roman celebratory arch, from which the former clearly gained its inspiration. In 1266, Charles I became the ruler of the Kingdom of Naples, whose capital was in Palermo at that time. When it was decided that the capital of the Kingdom of Naples would be moved to Naples itself, Charles ordered that a castle be built by the sea. The Castel dell'Ovo and Castel Capuano weren't sufficient in size or grandeur for the sovereigns of the time, and so the Castel Nuovo was built. The first version of the castle was completed in 1282. It was designed by the French architect Pierre d'Angicourt. The time of the Aragonese saw the passage from the medieval castle palace to the fortress as it now appears. It was adapted to the new needs of a time of war and the area surrounding the castle lost the residential character it had had under the Angevins. The structure of the Aragonese building is undoubtedly more massive than its Angevin predecessor and was quite similar to the present-day castle, which is the result of the clearance works of the early years of the 20th century. At the end of the 15th century, the French succeeded the Aragonese, though they didn't remain for long, as they were succeeded in turn by the Spanish viceroys and the Austrians. During the viceroy period, the defence structures of the castle, needed for purely military purposes, underwent further modification. With the advent of Charles III of Bourbon, who defeated the Emperor Charles VI, the castle was surrounded by buildings of all kinds, warehouses and houses, and this happened time and time again. In the first two decades of the 20th century, the Municipal Council began the work of isolating the castle from the annexed buildings in recognition of the historical and monumental importance of the fortress and the need to reclaim the piazza in front of it. The castle is today the venue of cultural events and also houses the Municipal Museum. Via Toledo owes its name to Pedro de Toledo, who ordered its construction with the idea of creating a new noble area. The project was a success, and around the elegant buildings, 
constructed over a few centuries, lower-class neighbourhoods soon arose as well, which the so-called Spanish quarters most faithfully represent. Created in the mid-16th century, and now one of the most characteristic and in some ways controversial areas of the city, this neighbourhood above the street, where many typical aspects of the Neapolitan philosophy of daily life have survived, progress and urbanisation, has in fact succeeded in preserving its original style, with a thick network of densely populated streets. Designed by Giovanni Antonio Medrano on behalf of King Charles of Bourbon, San Carlo Theatre was the first theatre to be built in Italy. When it was finished, this was the biggest opera house anywhere, with the capacity to seat 3,300 people. In order to produce a theatre of the calibre and prestige that Charles III wished to have, he commissioned two of the best architects of the time, Giovanni Antonio Medrano and Angelo Carasale. They designed a building that's both amazingly beautiful, but also has near-perfect acoustics. Opposite San Carlo Theatre is the grandest interior in southern Italy, the Galleria Umberto I. The most prominent example of the architectural aesthetics stemming from the Industrial Revolution Galleria Umberto was inaugurated in 1890 and named after Umberto I, King of Italy, when he was murdered. The gallery has a spectacular collage of Renaissance and Baroque ornamentation, tapering off to clean smoothness of marble at the ground concourse. The architecture joins a new Renaissance facade with the beautiful glass and iron roofing inside. Italian historical construction heritage is essentially constituted by masonry structures, iron structures or by their combination. Among the most widespread applications, the large metallic roofing systems, which between the 19th and 20th centuries were frequently used to cover urban galleries, represent an interesting example of the Belle Epoque architectural style in Italy. The English word liberty is used in Italian in an architectural sense and has nothing to do with politics, freedom or social struggle. It's simply a man's name, Arthur Lazenby Liberty, a London merchant whose shop specialised in ornaments, fabrics and miscellaneous art objects associated with the then emerging aesthetic movement of the late 19th century, known in French and English as Art Nouveau. Architecture was only one facet of Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau was characterised in external architecture by highly stylized, flowing curvilinear forms, as well as the new materials of the Industrial Revolution. It represents a wonderful aesthetic fusion of the industrial glass and metal with a spectacular collage of Renaissance and Baroque ornamentation. With an iron supporting structure and covered in glass, the entire gallery is lightness that blends perfectly with the airy fan lights and gallery wings. The style is similar to the Galleria Vittorio Emanuele in Milan. The gallery was built to stimulate commerce and to be a symbol of a city reborn. Coming out of the Umberto I gallery, one comes upon this small ornamented square named Piazza Trieste e Trento. The area has a large fountain in the centre of the square. In the past, this square was known as San Ferdinando Square due to the presence of the San Ferdinando Church with its facade inserted into the irregular plan of the square. 
The plans for the church were drawn up by the Society of Jesus, and the church was opened in 1665, after some years of interrupted construction. Arriving from Piazza Trieste e Trento, visitors will find themselves facing one of the most beautiful and monumental squares in Naples. Piazza del Plebiscito is the largest square in Naples and one of the largest open squares in Europe. It's a central gathering place for both residents and tourists of the city. The Church of San Francesco di Paola often draws comparisons with the Pantheon in Rome. The facade of the church features a portico with two ionic pillars and six formidable columns. The piazza's somewhat odd name refers to a national referendum of sorts that was taken in 1860 and which unified the Kingdom of Italy under the House of Savoy. The spectacular colonnades extend from the centre of the piazza in either direction to the Royal Palace and the Church of San Francesco di Paola. The church has a circular colonnade made of 34 columns of Corinthian order that sustain the grand coffered cupola. Isolated in the square, facing the basilica, stand the statues of Charles III, the founding father of the Bourbon dynasty in Naples, and Ferdinand I of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. The monarch is garbed in classical Roman fashion. Ferdinand also commissioned the statue to himself at the same time. He is, like his father, mounted and dressed in classical fashion. There are a wide variety of sites near Piazza del Plebiscito, including the Santa Croce di Palazzo, the Museo Artistico Industriale, the Naples Prefecture, and the Palazzo Reale. There are two major landmarks that flank the largest square in Naples. One of them is the Royal Palace, which lies to the east of the Piazza del Plebiscito. The designer was one of the most prominent architects of the day, Domenico Fontana. Perhaps the most distinguishing characteristic of the palace is the facade with its eight kings. This is a truly remarkable historical testament to the development of Naples as these kings represent completely different regimes and dynastic ambitions. There are many kings immortalized on the facade of the Palazzo Reale, such as Joaquim Murat and Charles III of Bourbon, Charles V of Habsburg, as well as Victoria Emmanuel II, and Alphonse of Aragon. The latter is by the sculptor d'Orsi, with his main interest for realism. Charles of Anjou also appears.
Today, the Royal Palace has various diverse functions. In particular, it's the seat of the National Neapolitan Library and of a museum structure, the Historical Apartment, in which visitors can see the original furnishings of the nobility. The exit from the piazza on the downhill side in Via Cesare Console leads to a small park with good views of the palace and of the marina and port, Vesuvius and the bay. In the centre of the park, the statue of Caesar Augustus stands. Augustus was clearly the greatest emperor in all of Roman history and the title, Father of His Country, was well deserved. The Gulf of Naples lies before the large city of Naples. The blue waters of the Gulf are bounded in the north by the Phlegrian islands of Procida and Ischia, and in the south by the legendary Capri. Boats head to the islands from Naples, and it's the best way to see the Gulf. In the most westerly part of the Gulf, Ischia is the largest Parthenopian island. Formed by six districts, Ischia has acquired international fame as a tourist destination thanks to its numerous thermal and thermomineral springs, the result of the island's volcanic origins. The town is divided into two distinct settlements. Ischia Ponte and Ischia Porto. Ischia Porto, named for its port, is the arrival and departure point for most of the island's ferry services. It's the largest of the three islands off the coast of Naples and more than holds its own in this trinity of beauty, rising from the azure waters of the Tyrrhenian Sea this haven seems a million miles away from the haranguing, energy-charged streets of Naples. A short bus ride from Ischia Porto lies Ischia Ponte, a charming seaside settlement dominated by the picturesque Castello Aragonese. The Aragonese Castle, the most impressive historical monument in Ischia, stands on a volcanic rock connected to the island by a bridge built in 1438 by Alfonso of Aragon. The castle overlooks the vast horizon of the sea. Under the Aragonese dynasty, it became a political, cultural and spiritual centre of notable interest. This fortified castle was used to protect Ischia's population from pirate attacks. The island of Ischia sprawls languidly over a mountainous and flower-draped terrain which rolls down to delightful small towns and villages. Points of attraction are the characteristic port, the evocative haven of Sant'Angelo's long golden beaches and the wooded hills and terraced vineyards. One of Ischia Island's particular architectural highlights are its traditional houses cut out of stone, known in Italian as Casa di Pietra. Most of these rock homes are built out of the island's green tough stone, pieces of volcanic rock that surfaced after tectonic activity around the second century AD.
The small and remarkable Isoleta del Fungo, the little island of the mushroom, owes its name to its characteristic shape, moulded by the erosion of the sea. A natural sculpture which emerges from the sea makes Laco Ameno town immediately recognisable. This is a volcanic block of green tuff, almost a joke of nature, with the creative forces of wind and sea, which have given the extraordinary shape of a real mushroom. Villages have preserved their historical centres with tiny streets, churches, sighting towers and monuments. Ischia's beaches are famous long white sandy beaches which lie between steep green hillsides and the deep blue sea of the Bay of Naples. Chitara Beach is one of the most beautiful in the Mediterranean. It's permanently exposed to the sun and its waters are among the most crystal clear of the island. There are about 37 kilometers of coastline, and although some of the shore is rocky, you're never very far from a beach. Popularly called the Emerald Island, Ischia is covered in pine groves, with sparkling waters gently crashing into its beaches. Forio stands on the west coast of Ischia. This region is a favourite with artists who come here to work in peace and quiet. The beach of San Francesco is located a few kilometres from the port of Forio. In the Gulf of Naples, just off the end of the Sorrentine Peninsula, Capri is a veritable treasure trove, bursting with natural beauty, with its stunning panoramas and dramatically beautiful coastline. The island of Capri, having no natural port, was accessible only from a small beach the charming seaside port of Marina Grande, encompassed by two narrow arms or keys, borders the picturesque town of Capri. It lies to the north of the island and faces the Gulf of Naples. Houses along the port are still typical of the ancient dwellings of Capri's fishermen. The heart of Capri is Piazza Umberto I, a small, compact, closed-off square. This immense cliff that rises from the abyss is a true miracle, combining earth, sky, sea and light. The green of the vegetation on the steep rocky slopes the incomparable scenery and the mix of nature, art and culture make this the most dreamed of and celebrated island of them all. The gardens of Augustus, crisscrossed by innumerable alleys and little stairways, is an oasis of green with a magnificent belvedere. From the gardens, one arrives at the Marina Piccolo by way of Via Krupp, a torturous street that descends to the sea. In 1900, the German magnate Krupp financed a street for travel by foot that joined the Quisisana where he lived to the Marina Piccola. Built with admirable skill, 
It's been called the world's most beautiful road, thanks to the manner in which it hugs the rock and the appropriate use of local construction materials. The craggy, flower-covered island of Capri is home to a vast number of artistic, historical and natural wonders. This paradise of idleness, surrounded by the bluest of seas, has been enchanting visitors for centuries. A tour around the island of Capri by boat is without doubt a unique and truly exhilarating experience. The spectacularly dramatic coast is characterized by numerous creeks, tiny bays and caves. The Blue Grotto is one of the world famous emblems of the island of Capri. It's known for its water's intense and brilliant hues of blue. The magical light and color effects are created by the sunlight, which is reflected into the grotto by the 25 meter deep water. The Faraglioni are three rocks looming from the sea with a natural tunnel that runs right through. These are three of the most famous remaining rocks which have survived coastal landslides and erosion by the sea. These splendid geological formations, undoubtedly the best known feature of the island's jagged form, hold the numerous nests of Capri's large Diomede gulls. Vibrant, passionate, unique. Words which perfectly describe the Bay of Naples and the densely populated city of Naples. It offers a series of unique and unforgettable town and seascapes.